Warning, the following podcast contains the fuck out of some profanity. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by HelloFresh, ZipRecruiter, and by the new candy for whoever the fuck eats Necco wafers, Just Chalk. Just Chalk, because otherwise, you're just paying somebody to lie to you. And now, The Scathing Atheist. The lackadaisical poet here to remind you that we did indeed evolve from filthy monkey freaks. Thursday. It's May 11th. And it's National Twilight Zone Day. Bring him to Native Rod Serling, baby. Ooh, ooh. That's right, listener. Eli swapped around the intro just so he could shout out Rod Sterling. It's important. No, important. Choice. It's not. <laughs> I've no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And from Dennis Rodman's, New Jersey, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Iran will officially mark themselves as a spoiler for America's future. King Charles III has a farcical land-based ceremony to avoid <laughs> looking silly. And we'll learn what Dennis Prager has instead of a conscience. <laughs> but first, the diatribe. Well, another day, another mass shooting, as is the way with America. And this one happened in Texas, so if nothing else, it really puts a damper on that whole good guy with a gun fantasy, doesn't it? But of course, this is a show about atheism, not a show about gun control. So I'll skip over all the really obvious and verifiable arguments in favor of a massive overhaul of our current everyone has a right to a John Wick basement's worth of death machines policies, and we'll just skip straight to the thoughts and prayers that come afterwards. See, inevitably, in the wake of this, America's 199th mass shooting of the year so far, depending on how you count it, it might actually be more than that, politicians whose job it is to actually do something about it instead called for thoughts and prayers. Although, if those prayers aren't for those specific politicians to do something about it, I don't know what the fuck everybody's praying for, for bullets to start turning into butterflies mid-flight. Anyway, having heard that same bullshit deflection at least 198 times this year already, Americans were ready to push back, and we did. Before they could even mutter the words, we were shouting them down with a reminder that we're sick and fucking tired of calls for wishing plus magical wishing in the wake of tragedy. Even American media, cowed as it perpetually is to the fragile sensibilities of Christians, push back against this shit. In the wake of this Texas shooting, CNN host Paula Reed interviewed Keith Self, that's the Republican congressman who represents the district where the massacre happened, and she put it to him directly. As soon as he tried to hide behind prayers, Reed asked him how he would respond to people who said prayers aren't enough. And his diatribe-worthy response started, quote, Well, those are people who don't believe in an almighty God who is absolutely in control of our lives. I'm a Christian. I believe that he is. End quote. So first of all, Yes. So fucking what? You haven't answered the criticism. You've just restated half of the premise. But secondly, in addition to yes, no. While you and me are no doubt people who don't believe in an almighty God who's in control of our fucking lives, that's not true of all the people that are asking self to do more than ask his invisible friend to up his game. Hell, most of those people, most of the people taking issue with that response believe in an almighty God. And even they have to admit that when it comes to preventing mass shootings in America, he could really use some help from the fucking legislature. But third, and most importantly, consider the degree that you have to misinterpret the criticism to get there. People who are coming out against this thoughts and prayers bullshit, we're, we're not taking issue with prayer. I mean, I, mean I, I, I do take issue with prayer, but it's a completely different issue. But to think that the problem we have is that you're praying would mean you'd have to simultaneously believe that we're mad at you for thinking. When people point out how useless thoughts and prayers are to the victims of mass shootings, they're not coming out against prayers any more than they're coming out against thoughts. And, and, and what we're saying is do more. And by more, we really mean anything at fucking all at this point. But of course, self isn't going to do any of that. 
Instead, he's going to jump at every opportunity to turn this into some us versus them culture war bullshit about persecuting Christians just as soon as he can think of a way to make fewer random massacres sound woke. So after taking umbrage at the very suggestion that wishing in his head wasn't a viable and sufficient public safety strategy, he said, quote, prayer is powerful in the lives of those people that are devastated, as, as though telling a congressman that prayer wasn't enough was the same as telling the Christian family members of those victims to stop praying. And as if he hadn't sufficiently tipped his hand at that point, he added, quote, I know people want to make this political, but prayers are important and they are powerful in the families who are devastated right now, end quote. So it's either prayers or politics. Choose a fucking side. But even Christians know that dichotomy is bullshit. Some of them do, at least. I, th I think my own senator and the politician I've personally donated more money to than any other pastor, Raphael Warnock, summarized it pretty goddamn well. He chimed in on the controversy around self's obfuscating bullshit with a statement that read, quote, as a pastor, I'm praying for those who are affected by this tragedy, but I hasten to say that thoughts and prayers are not enough. In fact, it is a contradiction to say that you are thinking and praying and then do nothing. It is to make a mockery of prayer. It is to trivialize faith. We pray not only with our lips, we pray with our legs. We pray by taking action, end quote. And look, I can't obviously agree with that statement. Prayer makes a mockery of itself. Faith couldn't be more trivial. And saying that we pray by taking action is the same as saying that we take action by taking action. But it's a strong indicator that you don't need to be an atheist to see the problem with self's response. And strangely enough, you apparently don't have to be an atheist to admit that prayers don't do shit. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Din and Nehru to my Ferrari, Heath Enright, and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to appoint a hero? Okay, I feel like it's getting sexual now with the Zelda stuff. Like, really sexual. Yeah, now, is that because he's done Zelda two shows in a row or because we can see his erection, Heath Enright? Um, yes. It's very, nope. okay, <laughs> very getting sexual. But, so, but here's the thing is that, like, speaking of things that make me erect is a bad segue into the Matreon plug, and that's where I have to go. <laughs> is it? Uh, yeah, it's fair, yeah. But yes, listeners, it's May once again, so we're asking you to go to patreon.com slash scathingatheist, even louder than we normally ask you to do that, to help keep our show going for another year. You get early access to longer episodes. You get behind-the-scenes stuff. You get extra headlines some weeks. You get access to our annual patron-only pajama party live stream. And you get the satisfaction of knowing that to some degree, this show is your fault. So head over to patreon.com slash scathingatheist and pledge as little as a dollar an episode and as much as significantly more than that. And uh, yeah. speaking of how we pay the bills, it's time for a word from our first sponsor this week, HelloFresh. Dude, it's time for the HelloFresh ad. Where is Heath? I don't know. He said something about working on his own project. Well, he, he better hurry up. Gem because we do it. So gentlemen. Oh. Gentlemen, may I present to you the latest and greatest of food ism. I got uh, Jello. You got Jello, <laughs> Eli, you stupid fool. This is Jello Fresh. I'm I'm sorry, Jello Fresh. Yeah, so you know how Hello Fresh delivers delivers the is the Hello the Fresh delivers, delivers farm fresh pre portioned ingredients mm. and seasonal recipes right to your doorstep, so you can skip trips to the grocery store and count on Hello Fresh to make home yep. cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Meal kit. Yep. And with Jello Fresh, I put all the food in Jello shots, and you just slurp them up. Oh, okay. But Keith, Hello Fresh does more than just delicious dinners. Not only can you take your pick from forty weekly recipes, but you can choose from over a hundred items to round out your order, from snacks and easy lunches to desserts and pantry necessities. Everything arrives in one box on a delivery day that you choose. Yeah, well, this is Jello is Hello Fresh Jello. Um, no, it's no, not. it's not exactly. But Heath, this May, HelloFresh is celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Try limited time authentic recipes created in partnership with Chef Serbi Sani of New York's Tagmo Restaurant and enjoy a cultural <clears throat> taste tour in your own kitchen. I love Hawaii after college. Super nice. It's true. HelloFresh sent us a box to try and the food was amazing and it unpacked in seconds. That's why I, Eli Bosnick, personally endorse it as a product. I am sold. 
We're a snap. No, Keith, you're you're doing the Jello thing. In the right? Game. No, never mind. Cancel that. Just go to HelloFresh.com slash Scathing16 and use the code Scathing16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's right. Just go to HelloFresh.com slash Scathing16 and use code Scathing16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Nice. All right. Thanks, guys. Noah. No, let me touch your dentures. No, gross. Let me touch them. Okay. Upstairs. You won't even let me. I know, buddy. I know. Touch them. <laughs> Teeth. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, in Nobody's Coming to Save the King news, <laughs> God doesn't exist, and the UK is one of the most secular countries on the planet, and the king sucks. Yep. But despite all that, the coronation of King Charles III last weekend was an absurd hundred million pound Christian sorcery party, sponsored by, apparently, a mystical apothecary shop with a colonialism theme. They should stop doing all of that. Yeah, look, look. if they had piled one more fucking item on that dude, they'd have crushed him to death and we'd have had to start all over. Ugh. First, everyone complains that a bunch of British old people froze to death this winter. Now they're putting too much stuff on an old guy. You people are impossible <laughs> to please. Impossible. Okay, so maybe you're wondering how religious is it really? Well, How let's religious start, is yeah, it? Great question. Let's start with the proclamation of accession. I don't get which it. Which was recited when the queen died and Charles took over last year. The <laughs> official proclamation was read aloud in London, Edinburgh, Cardiff, and Hillsborough, and a whole bunch of other cities and towns across the realms. Also, they say things like across the realms. Stop mm -hmm. that, too. So according <laughs> to that proclamation, the UK has a divinely chosen monarch who rules, quote, by the grace of God. And the proclamation started by politely acknowledging that God murdered the queen. Exact words. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign Lady Queen Elizabeth II. And, and from there, they beseech God to bless King Charles, which is a big ask, I'd say. And <laughs> the very first official utterance out of his mouth after taking over last year was an oath with a Bible in his hand that he solemnly swears to maintain the Presbyterian government of the Church of Scotland. Huh. That was his first thing. Yeah, just because there are no good reasons for monarchy doesn't mean that there aren't especially bad ones. <laughs> yeah, can we get him like a... 70-year-old Falstaff. I feel like he just needs a Falstaff, mm -hmm. right? And shape right up. And that brings us to the coronation ceremony from last week, which was absolutely absurd. The whole thing is directly modeled on the crowning of Israelite kings from the Old Testament. And there's a very important, very long, very serious list of <laughs> magical items. The biggest and most prominent is the coronation throne, or King Edward's chair. It's um, it's just a chair. It's a chair. It's a chair. But <laughs> it it's held chair. up by golden lions. And the chair looks extremely uncomfortable. Like the worst chair at a party that you got stuck with. Yeah, and look, like at the very least, he should have had to do a series of side quests and bring them all to all the items together in Westminster Abbey before he could become <laughs> king or something. No, you got to let the Zelda references go. Do you talk about your baby all the time. All the time. It's true. Exhausting. And that brings us <laughs> to the Stone of Destiny, also known as the Stone of Scone or the Stone of Scone, I guess. It's just a big rock. It's a big rock with very mysterious iron rings on each side. And nobody Ooh. knows why. Historians can't decide. But it somehow contains part of the magic, uh, especially the part about owning Scotland. So they use it for every coronation. It goes under the magic uncomfortable chair and the chair magic doesn't work without the rock magic. Hmm. It was kept in Westminster Abbey for centuries until a group of delightful Scottish students managed to steal it on Christmas Day of 1950. But England eventually got it back in 1952. And then in 1996, PM John Major moved it permanently to Edinburgh Castle, except when England needs it back to do the magic monarch party, like last week. I mean... When it confers ownership of Scotland, it feels more of like a hot potato situation. But you know what? Go off, Big okay. C. Go off. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have three items that all go together. In order to become the monarch, you got to get oiled up. 
which makes sense, I guess. Lots of people I'd describe as dry taking the throne mm -hmm. across history. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> they get anointed with a magical oil poured from a magical golden bird and into a magical golden spoon. The spoon is uh, an old spoon, like a nice one, but that's it. It's, it's an old spoon. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not like they had it lying around deep. I don't, they, they, <laughs> they, they lost rush it for to a the while. silver drawer the day of to be like, shit, 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 spoon. <laughs> I, think, I, I think they lost it for a while. Cromwell like melted down a bunch of their gold and gave away the spoon. Somebody eventually got it back to them. So that's the spoon. And the golden bird, it's called the ampulla, which holds the oil. It's based on a legend that says the Virgin Mary appeared before St. Thomas Becket and offered him a golden eagle and some oil. So about 300 years later, they made a golden cruet with a hole in the beak <laughs> to pour the oil into the spoon magically. Right. Yeah. And remember, guys, no matter how oiled up the monarch is, you should also apply lube to the national asshole before you go any further. Both should be lubed. So Smart. no such thing as too much. <laughs> Thank you, Noah. <laughs> Heath has sullied our podcast with subpar anal sex advice as metaphor for far too long. <laughs> for far too long. <laughs> I feel like it was good advice. And of course, the official coronation oil is obviously the most important part. It's made from olives harvested from monasteries on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Jesus prayed there the day before he got crucified, and that's a, that's a good thing, apparently, so they use that. The oil for King Charles got declared to be officially holy oil during a ceremony in March at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, also in Jerusalem. Huh. And in a new twist, they're using a formula that's vegan for the first time ever. Oh. Yeah, it used to contain something called ambergris, an absurdly expensive form of whale vomit, but not this year. So that's nice. Hopefully the magic still works, but vegan. So cool. Mm. Yeah, but, but let's be fair here. If the vegan recipe works just as good, this will be a historical first. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe Charles heard all the memes about eating the rich and he was like, okay, making myself taste vegan is a great solution. Here. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> I'm sure vegans taste better. Probably like grass fed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. just for the record, I could keep going with a bunch more very silly objects for a long time. Of course, the Coronation Bible is part of that list, but none of this matters because it's all fake and royalty is stupid. That being said, watch a few clips of the ceremony if you get a chance. It's honestly, it's like a sketch comedy. It's very funny. Yeah, it looks like an elaborate punishment for like mid-century buggery. It's yeah, right, <laughs> right. And in victimless crime news, as theocrats seize ever more control of the American government, I think it's important to periodically remind our listeners what the end game looks like here. And for that, we need to look no further than the world's largest theocracy, Iran, where two men were just executed for blasphemy over their participation in a group chat called Critique of Superstition and Religion. The two men, Yusuf Murad and Sardala Fazeli Zare, were arrested in May of 2020 and spent months in solitary confinement, unable to contact their families. Yeah, and that chat did not need to have any content. You just name that chat and you get side tackled five seconds later by theocracy critiquing itself right. for you. You don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So first of all, thanks to the listener who sent us this story at scathingnews at gmail.com and asked me not to use his name since, you know, he could be executed for sending us the fucking story. Okay. I feel like Noah chose this story, so I'd feel weird doing my usual interruption with a silly gif, but it's not going to work, no illusions. Possum nipples coming your way, buddy. Big box marked atheist snips. No, Look not, out for it. That's not going to happen. Scathingnews at gmail.com. So, <laughs> but yeah, Iran's judiciary confirmed the executions through their Mizan news agency, though it's still unclear exactly when they happened. Officially, the two were charged with insulting the prophet Muhammad and promoting atheism. Mizan also accused them of burning a copy of the Quran. But to be honest, it's not clear whether they're saying that these dudes actually burned a Quran or whether they shared an image of a burning Quran. And given the credibility of the Iranian judiciary, it's honestly not clear that they did either of those things. Yeah. Hard to do that on a message thread too. Or maybe like a link like a to it. I don't know. <laughs> Burned it onto a CD, but they're yeah. still getting in big trouble. It's worth noting that executions for blasphemy are actually pretty rare in Iran. 
executions are. Iran is behind only China in total a number of executions per year. And I believe they top the list actually on a per capita basis. But this number has ramped up considerably since the eruption of anti-government protests in the wake of Masa Amini's murder at the hand of the state morality police last year. In 2022, Iran executed at least 582 people, up almost 75 percent from the year before. And as near as we can tell, they're on pace to top even that number in 2023. For comparison, the U.S., which I freely admit is barbaric in its use of the death penalty, executed 18 people. So Iran's beating our medieval asses by 32 times despite having a quarter of our population. And those are just the ones that we can verify. Whew. Anyway, you guys you guys do comedy now again. Though. <laughs> I was going to say, what a setup. Just possum nipples in there. There were possum yeah, nipples. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Coming your way. And in singularly stupid news, one of the things that never gets tiring about this job here at The Scathing Atheist is the stupid shit Christians get offended by. And funnier still is the insane lengths they will go to retaliate to their imagined offenses. From burning Harry Potter books to blowing up Budweiser, there's always a new low for Christians to stoop to. And we got what may be the funniest one of the year to date when an angry Christian removed the S from the sign for the (laughs) Garden of the Gods in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Because... Because there's only one there's God. Only yes, one. exactly. There's just only the one. one. <laughs> Love this. They're almost done after a bunch of chiseling helper guys like, wait, wait, couldn't we just make a fucking apostrophe before the S? <laughs> well, right. So oh, easier. damn it. Yeah, because like, keep in mind, they're not, we're not talking about them stealing the S off of a reader board. This was literally carved into stone, so they had to chisel the S out. This is not a quick swipe with some spray paint here. <laughs> yeah. So for the indoors kids like myself who've never heard of this thing, the Garden of the Gods is a 1,341.3 acre park in Colorado, 862 acres of which was made a landmark in 1971. And it's called that, at least according to Wikipedia, because one of the surveyors who mapped it in 1859, Mella S. Beach, suggested that it would be, quote, a capital place for a beer garden. And his companion, the young Rufus Cable, is what Wikipedia calls him, awestruck by the impressive rock formations, exclaimed, quote, beer garden? Why, it is a fit place for the gods to assemble. We will call it the Garden of the Gods, end quote. And so, yeah, pretty much since that moment, Christians have been losing their goddamn minds about that because they you know, lack the humor and acceptance of people from 1859. Right, yeah, yeah, they're a little more prudish. I, 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 God, Jesus, wait until they find out Capital Reef isn't a capital or a reef. They're going to get fucking carpal <laughs> tunnel from all the chisel. Mother, <laughs> liars. And I know what you're thinking. Come on now, Eli. You can't hold the actions of one wackadoo against all Christians. But first of all, yes, I can. Don't tell me what to do. Two, it's in their book. Mm-hmm. But three, mm-hmm. and this is my favorite, this is not the first time that this has happened this year. Really? Yes. This Parks Operations Administrator, Brett Tennis, said that this isn't the first time this has happened and that it's likely linked to a lengthy pattern of similar vandalism cases in the park, <laughs> which I am dying <laughs> to know more details about. Okay. My favorite part is that they chiseled off the letter S in the shape of a letter S. Right. They didn't so, even square it they didn't out. do anything. The big sign is still very clearly saying Garden of the Gods, just with like a different font for the last letter now. Or maybe Garden of the God 8, sort yeah, of. Yeah, right. Well, and it's clear just looking at this thing that at first the dude just chiseled out exactly the S and he thought, well, fuck, that doesn't work. <laughs> God damn, I'm like, I guess I'm going to have to chisel out them chisel marks too. Wait a minute, that still didn't work. <laughs> God, now God. it's God 8. Can we make it a really big one now? This is going to take forever. <laughs> now it's my username on Hotmail. What's happening? <laughs> Either way, heads up for the Christian who did the vandalism listening. We know you're listening. First of all, he's a big fan. If your God is defeated by pluralization, not powerful or all-knowing. No. Especially if he's supposed to be the only God. That would be like, Heath freaking out because they called him Heath's and right. Not with an apostrophe, though. So, uh, yeah, when you're running solo, you and your followers don't need to prove it by defaming national landmarks, I guess, <laughs> is what I'm saying. 
And on that note, we're going to pause for a word from this week's second sponsor, ZipRecruiter. I mean, you could email him again. I've sent like 10 emails. Hey, guys. What you doing? Oh, hey, Noah. So Eli and I hired a graphic designer off of one of those websites to make us a logo for, for Jello Fresh. You're still doing Jello Fresh? Dreams don't die. No illusions. They don't die. Anyway, we paid him like two weeks ago and he hasn't gotten back to us. Look, guys, if you're looking to hire in the right way, why don't you try ZipRecruiter? What's ZipRecruiter? Whether you're starting a new business or growing one, if you want to be successful, you need the most talented people on your team. That's where ZipRecruiter comes in. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash scathing. I don't know, Noah. How does that work? ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology finds highly qualified candidates for a wide range of roles. Got your eye on one or two people you'd think would be perfect for your job? ZipRecruiter lets you send them a personal invite so they're more likely to apply. ZipRecruiter also offers attention-grabbing labels that speak to job flexibility, like remote, training provided, urgent, and more, to really help your job stand out. That sounds amazing, but where do we sign up? Let ZipRecruiter fill all your roles with the right candidates. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash scathing. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash S-C-A-T-H-I-N-G. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. All right. Thanks, Noah. So uh, any Jell-O customers yet? No, but... A lot of product loss. I was hungry. Yeah, like a lot. And thirsty or whatever. <laughs> yeah, switches. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate race. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massage. Okay, so let's be clear up front that everybody misses $5 million. You never get so goddamn rich you don't notice five million bucks flying out the door, even when you're getting Putin-level kickbacks. But something tells me the $5 million award isn't the thing that most pisses Trump off about the E. Jean Carroll case. So let me back up and fill in the details here. Back in 2019, author and former cable news host E. Jean Carroll came forward to say that Trump raped her back in the 90s. He said she was full of shit, so she sued him for defamation. The trial took place over the last couple of weeks, and it was filled with the exact same disgusting bullshit that you come to expect when you follow any rape trial. But it turns out that E. Jean Carroll was a hell of a witness in her own defense. And when Trump's lawyers started that, well, why didn't you scream bullshit? She shut him down in a way that echoed through the media for days. Well, we got the verdict on Tuesday, and it was pretty much exactly what we were hoping for. While the jury stopped short of saying that Carol proved Trump raped her, they did say that the preponderance of evidence was that he sexually assaulted her. And let's face it, some of the evidence was to access Hollywood tape where he brags about how often he sexually assaults women. So I don't think that was a very hard case to make. The jury also found that he defamed her when he denied the charges, which amped up the punitive damages quite a bit, to the tune of about $5 million, all told. That is five million bucks he has to pay her. Of course, Trump has vowed to appeal the verdict and he'll probably do it because he's too fucking stupid to realize that five million dollars is a small price to pay to get the that time Trump provably sexually assaulted someone's story out of the daily fucking news cycle before we get any further into the presidential campaign. And from what I can tell, he's not particularly likely to win the appeal either. And even if he does we'll all still know that a jury looked at the evidence and decided it was clear that Trump sexually assaulted a woman. What's more, a bunch of rich, rapey dudes were just put on notice that even 30 years later, their crimes could come back and take a $5 million bite out of their futures. Anyway, I know this is a show about atheism, and I know Noah just did a diatribe about mission drift, but this news was too good not to revel in for a minute. So on that unusually happy note, I'll wrap things up and hand you back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And in putting the corrupt in bankrupt news, the Diocese of Oakland is filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, but damn, are their cemeteries perpetually maintained? This comes, as I'm sure will shock you to your very core, in response to a spate of new child sex abuse cover-up lawsuits that were enabled by a recent California law extending the statute of limitation on such cases. Because the alternative is having a finish line for child rapists encoded into law. Anyway, 
California Assembly Bill 218, which the diocese names in their bankruptcy filing, took effect in January of 2020. And since then, no fewer than 330 new lawsuits arose surrounding the fact that the Diocese of Oakland is a child rape factory first and a religious institution second. Yeah. And I love that they were like, well, I hope you're happy, California lawmakers. Your child rape punishment law has driven us out of business. Yeah. And California is like, yeah, that was the point. Yeah. No, no. I, I should note here that there are plenty of good reasons for a bankruptcy judge to just reject the filing. According to Dan McNevin with the Survivors Network for Those Abused by Priests or SNAP, they, they did a financial assessment of the Oakland Diocese back in 2004 and found that it controlled over a billion dollars worth of real estate and carried no debt. And hey, we're, we're talking about uh, fucking California real estate. So, you know, it's gone up in value since 2004. Bay Area, like yeah. the most expensive place. Right. So Snap estimates that the diocese has between three and four billion dollars in real estate holdings right now. So unless those cases come to better than nine million dollars a piece, that's not enough to bankrupt these motherfuckers. Those cases should cost them more than that, but I'm sure yeah. they won't. So. Well, right, mm -hmm. exactly. But but it's worth emphasizing here that this isn't just about saving money. The Vatican is literally made of fucking gold. They've got money. The goal here is to avoid trial. If, if these cases are adjudicated, the diocese will have to present records to the court to show internal documents that remind us how brazen and callous they were about this shit and to remind us how high up the food chain the culpability really goes. Quoting McNevin here, talking about the common tactic of these preventative bankruptcies, quote, it's usually about preventing access to files and to secrets and embarrassing facts around how the abuse was enabled by bishops and chancellors and vicar generals, end quote. OK, we need to address how the Catholic Church is organized like independent sleeper cells in a terrorist organization at this point. Right. Yep. Like, the legal system acts like they're not all connected to the Vatican. We know they are. If one cell goes bankrupt, sue the fucking Vatican or just go there and take their Nazi gold that we know they have. What are we waiting for? Yeah. Has the Catholic Church considered firing Tucker Carlson? <laughs> I hear that works when you got to Honestly, be. probably. Now, of course, as I'm sure the listeners have already guessed, there's no scenario where the diocese has to actually just fold up shop and go home. Because, look, if they were avoiding accountability by selling all their assets and then having to fuck off to Rome, I'd grudgingly accept that as an overall good and a victory. But they make clear, even in their filing, that this arm and this leg and this torso over here of the diocese are actually a totally different entity that wouldn't be affected by this bankruptcy or by the lawsuits. They actually say in their press release about all of this shit that their employees will still be getting their paychecks regardless and that all the schools they run will continue to operate without interruption. But then again, this is the same press release that says they came to this decision because it was, quote, the best way to ensure a fair and equitable outcome for abuse survivors, end quote. So and it's not like I've got that shit on good authority or anything. Right. Yeah. Don't want the money to go to their heads. This is for them that we're doing this. <laughs> yeah. And finally tonight, Jesus and the apostles were definitely fucking. Or they weren't. It doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. if you're a right-wing <laughs> Christian lunatic, it matters so goddamn much. These people talk about what would Jesus do all the time, and it's all made up. They just claim he was into whatever to suit their shitty politics thing at the moment. But if somebody else talks about what Jesus would do, they have a meltdown. And that's what happened last week when some artwork was displayed at the European Parliament building. In the words of Pink News, the piece that led to the meltdown is depicting Jesus being surrounded by, quote, leather-clad muscle daddies. Yeah, I mean, honestly, they should take it as a compliment that Jesus had such an attractive group of muscle daddies, if anything. Yeah, it's a really nice-looking group of apostles, muscle daddy apostles, yes. So the artist is Elizabeth Olsen, not... The Scarlet Witch, a different one. That we know of. <laughs> okay, fair point. She's a Swedish photographer who happens to be lesbian. And according to her, the work is showing Jesus Christ loving LGBTQ plus rights, which sounds like exactly what Jesus would do. Eh. I'm just guessing, though, because he's <laughs> mostly made up in books and he fucks a tree to death at one point, I think. So it's hard to follow his headspace. <laughs> but I feel like he would not try to shut down an art exhibition because some leather enthusiast guys are hugging him in a picture. Nonetheless, Christian bigots are trying to shut down the exhibit. In response, Olson pointed out the millions of paintings by famous artists that show Jesus 
lovingly surrounded by hetero people. Right. And some of those are super sexual. Right. Well, yeah, let's be clear. There is nothing sexual about this picture. Everybody's dressed. Nobody's squeezing anybody's cock. Everybody's keeping their tongues to themselves. It's literally just Jesus with gay people. And that's what they're freaking out about. Yeah, right. Also worth noting that if they were squeezing his cock or washing his feet in slow motion like perverts, <laughs> the painting would be more <laughs> biblical, not less. Yeah, they're right, That's right. Fingering him. Book. Yeah. Dick his foot, a lot of washing feet. Yeah. So according to the right wing politicians having a freak out, the photo is vulgar, disrespectful and blasphemous. One particular bigot, MEP Maria Veronica Rossi of Italy's far right mega party said the leather <laughs> apostles are quote sadomasochistic slaves now in fairness one guy is wearing a chain going to a wrist shackle but he could easily be a top with the lord and savior we don't know mm -hmm. or he just wears that stuff and sure. they have a balanced power dynamic when they fuck again we just don't know you're speculating well besides according to jesus it's okay to have sadomasochistic slaves as long as they get up once every 24 hours or whatever. <laughs> yeah, read your Paul, Maria. Also, read your Timothy and quit your job. Well, that too, doing yeah. The All that stuff. Thing. And just for context, the bigots are freaking out about an exhibition that's happening in a non-public wing of the building. Right. And the only people who can see it are members of European Parliament who get a special permit to do so. And of course, who choose to do so. Now, I know it might sound like the EU was forcing conservative Christians to view the exhibit or get kicked out of Europe. Turns out that's not what they were doing. Bottom line, if Jesus ever comes back, he's going to hate Christianity. Like, he might sue for name and likeness. Like, they're really Absolutely. fucking up his yeah. name with that. <laughs> All right. Well, now we have a wacky courtroom comedy to draft. So we're going to close the headlines for the night. <laughs> Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji. And when we come back, we'll find out what Dennis Prager is doing instead of being allowed to see his grandchildren. Hey, hey. hey, podcast listener. As we mentioned at the beginning of the show, it's Matreon, that time of the year when we come to you, hat in hand, and ask you for money. And as of this recording, hundreds of you have already done that. But what if it was thousands? Thousands, exactly, Noah. If we have 1,000 new or upgrading patrons this month, I will legally change my name to Keith Enright. And if 2,000 of you pledge or upgrade your pledge, I'll change my baby's name to Heath Enright. We're always blown away by what our listeners manage to come up with when we fundraise, but name-changing amounts of money is a goal that we have yet to hit. So head over to matreon.com. That's M-A-Y-T-R-E-O-N.com or pledge or upgrade to make your dreams come true. But it's not just that. By supporting the show on Patreon, you'll be helping us make these shows possible, make new shows like D&D Minus possible. Which I should point out started as a Matreon goal. It did, it did. And much, much more. So one more time, head over to any of our Patreon accounts or just check out Matreon.com to give us your money, please. Matreon, do your part. And there could be a lot of legal paperwork in our future. Even granting that they ban books from libraries, label teachers as groomers for acknowledging LGBTQ people, and say that arming teachers is better than passing common sense gun laws, you could argue that the most disrespectful thing the conservatives ever did to schools was adding the U to Prager U. So we're diving back into the cesspool of conservative YouTube once again in this week's God Awful Mini. So tell us, Heath, what will we be breaking down today? We watched Don't Trust Your Conscience, which sounded honestly like good advice for the audience at PragerU, but it's not. <laughs> they, they did it wrong. They did the wrong angle. Yep. And Eli, how bad was this mini? Well, if you love the bizarre worldview of Prager University, but you're mad they haven't taken on thoughts yet, you <laughs> will love this YouTube video. All right, so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah, I'm going to go with best worst adding text to your video. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Prager kept forgetting to leave space for the words he wanted to put up on the screen. So they had to violently change the camera angle each time 
to move his entire body to the side of the frame yep. to then have text next to him. Mm -hmm. It was like he was getting muscled out constantly by the text. <laughs> yeah. It was just like, whew. All right, so I'm going to, obviously we'll save this for the end, but I'm going to go with best worst solution. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right, when it comes time to the like, well, you know, what should I do about this? It falls flatter than anything has ever fallen before. Oh, I thought you were talking, because he talks about the Holocaust in there, and I was like, all right, yeah. Oh, so <laughs> final <laughs> solution. Cool. <laughs> and I'm going to go with best worst example. We'll talk. It's like a one off sentence in one of his many examples of why conscience is a bad idea, but it's truly a nonsense statement, right? He might as well say, well, then why is there air? Right on. I I, I don't know which one you mean. I know it's so a tricky. I'll point it out when yeah. it comes. I'll get there. It's a teaser. Yeah, there's, there's, there are definitely multiple contenders for that. All right. So, so yeah. So the, the opening bit, the opening premise of this video is I'm going to debunk the very concept that you should let your conscience be your guide. Yeah. Lots of people say you should be ethical. However, that's how <laughs> <Right>. it's <done. laughs> That's not great. Yeah. Well, that is a prerequisite to doing Prager U, I'm sure. Yeah. Finally, Dennis Prager is coming out against that liberal cuck, Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> right. <laughs> He goes, you know, through most of human history, we accepted that conscience wasn't enough and we needed God and God based moral instruction to get us through. And I'm like, yeah, how were our morals back then, man? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's talking about Western history. He specifically says that. He's yes, like, Western right. history says you need a God to be moral. I was like, okay, what else does Western history say, Dennis? Did you want to mention <laughs> any other stuff from that? Yeah. yeah. On that point that your conscience isn't a good moral guide for your whole life. It's like, yeah, that's. That's super obvious to most people, Dennis. That's like saying how hungry you are isn't the best way to diagnose medical conditions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the point is, what he misses the whole time is that what you need to be a good person is a good conscience. What you need to be a good person and yet get behind the idea of burning heretics is a conscience and then another thing, which is, of course, God-based rules. Yeah, Judeo-Christian God-based rules. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, very, very much so, yeah. So he's like, you know, the, the idea that conscience is all you need is a byproduct of modern secular society, and they're pretty irrational. <laughs> Here's a list of other irrational things that secular people would have you believe. What a weird start to this point. The whole, right. like, having a conscience problem was caused by modern secular society. And he's trying to fight against that. And now he has examples. Yeah. Right. Just out of the fucking blue. He's like, so if you think that secular people are are smart, well, why do they think dot, dot, dot? And his first one is it, it, there is no discussion. He's not going to sneak some transphobia into. He's like, the first one is that men give birth. They do. Dumb example. Yep. Just like a thing that happens, man. Yep. So that we can watch happen. His second example is the idea that Western civilization, these are his words, Western civilization is no better than any other. <laughs> Ooh. White people aren't the best at everything. Yeah, correct. That's correct. Well, but but any other? Like, <laughs> like there, there's literally no civilization that anyone thinks is worse. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> In the words of former President Barack Obama, go on. <laughs> yeah, right. So, and then he adds, if you're colorblind, you're racist. That's his final example of irrational things that secular people believe. No fucking, I, I have to assume that this is from his I don't see color spiel that he gives when people ask why he doesn't work with black people. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, like the whole like, oh, well, I'm colorblind is fucking insane. No one's colorblind. And even if even if you mean it in the folksy, like I treat folks like folks things, that would be like, I don't need no wheelchair ramp. I don't see wheelchairs. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes, exactly. But yeah, but then he explains to us that the problem is, is that the conscience is easy to manipulate, unlike biblical rules, right? Obviously, like you yeah, can't no imagine good. someone Hard manipulating fast. that stuff. <laughs> yeah, he goes, it's as malleable as putty. And I wrote in my notes, oh my God, he had to include that because his dumbass audience doesn't know what malleable means. And it makes me <laughs> totally so happy. You know, putty like squishy squish, and we actually hear some squishy squish yes. noises here, too. And we yeah. see a visual of putty. We also see this, I, I, I think it's supposed to be puppets caught in strings visual, but it looks like people <laughs> like 
assaulted by a spaghetti wielding yeah. giant? No, mm. he's like, yeah, the reality is a puppeteer manipulates your conscience with strings that in my graphic, he apparently forgot to untangle and he's having a lot of trouble <laughs> pushing the knot down like four Nintendo 64 controllers. <laughs> so, been there for a long time. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. And he's like, but think about all of the people, the evil people throughout history that did things that they thought like that they resolved with their conscience. And he gives again, he gives a list of examples. He goes like Nazis communists and Islamic terrorists. Why would you mention the Nazis and the Islamic terrorists there? You had other ones without, you know, the religion directly built into how horrible it was. Just use those. Yeah. Really? Right. No, I, I love, though, that he, he specifically excluded Christian and Jewish terrorists because he knows his audience. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> I also just, I have to love that he goes, and this was my best worst. He goes, why doesn't conscience stop people from doing evil things? And I was like, I mean, it, it does, Dennis. Some, that's what the word means, right? It's not, not all the time. Okay. But the point <laughs> is he's saying there's the problem of evil. Therefore, the omnipotent creator of the universe who made evil is what you should believe in. That's that's where he's going with this. Where that really is. Like there are a lot of parts of this where my my notes are just. Do you guys think maybe he legit doesn't know what the word conscience means? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's claiming secular morality is prone to manipulating people, and then he makes that point about the problem of evil. He's very very confused for a university professor. I would say. Yeah, I, I wrote in my notes when he said that. To be clear, that sentence is so stupid. I don't know what it could mean. <laughs> right. Right. Well, yeah. They, and then he follows that dumb shit up with the thing where he says, like, you know, your conscience doesn't produce your feelings and behaviors. Your feelings and behaviors produce your conscience. What the fuck are you even talking about? <laughs> what the hell does that mean? He's like a shitty robot trying to make it through a traffic stop. How do I emotions? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> From my brain flesh. Yeah. And he's saying every evil person has a clear conscience. That's kind of the point he's trying to make. But yeah, like, uh -huh. no, that's just you, <laughs> right. Dennis Prager. What are you talking about? Well, yeah, it, it surprises no one that fucking Dennis Prager doesn't seem to be familiar with what it's like to have a conscience. But yeah, people are bad at math. So we're getting rid of that. We're doing religious class instead for all. What are you talking about? <laughs> he's got this. He's got this amazing moment. There's a little graphic of a guy stealing and there's a little thought bubble that says they have insurance. And I think Dennis's point <laughs> is that people who steal think what they're doing is right as long as the people right. they're stealing from have insurance. I wrote in my notes, tell on yourself less, Dennis. Tell yeah. on yourself <laughs> less. <laughs> Might as well be a cartoon of Dennis being like, I can make bullshit right-wing videos. What does it matter? <laughs> Most of my listeners will be dead in a couple of years. <laughs> I love to he starts his next point by saying and here's another proof as though like some previous proof had been presented no, and we just missed it absolutely reject the premise of this but go ahead yeah proceed governor yeah he's like consider that people on both sides of conflict say that they're following their conscience and I'm like well yeah but one or the other of them has got some fucking religion or political ideology fucking with it. Yeah. Though, right. Cause like over and over again, he keeps presenting like things that are refuted by just adding right, right. But your conscience can be short circuited by religion or political ideology. Yeah. Is what happens. The first example he uses here is the Nazis. And I wrote in my notes, does Dennis Prager think the Nazis were going with a gut feeling? Right. Like Hitler woke up from a long night of weird dreams and was like, guys, I don't know about you, but I'm just like, oh, I'm feeling like we got to gas some Jews. You know what yeah, I'm right. saying? Like we got, oh, it's just my, my heart tells me that. I'm going to call them. No, he's like, yeah, take World War II, for example. I'm like, no, the, the Nazis knew they were baddies. I've seen the sketch, right? They knew. <laughs> Also, he's saying the source of the absolute morality is Judeo-Christian values in the Bible. Like, does he think Muslim people are really just phoning it in with the faith part? And that's how <laughs> you, you just go to people on both sides think they're correct? Oh, no, nah, they're faking it. And then, and then we get, I think, probably the worst animation in the whole thing because he's like even the Japanese soldiers who raped Korean women th had did so with clear conscience. And I'm like, why would you think that and also by the way like when americans were in korea we also 
raped Korean women. Our soldiers did too. Like it's weird that he would specify only the Japanese ones there. Also, nobody was like, I actually feel great about this. Just to be clear. I, I think this is <laughs> right. Exactly. Guys, guys, this gang rape is ethical, right? Like secular this ethical, right? This is super High five. good. Yeah. What am I supposed to do? Not have sex while I'm over here? That would be crazy. Yeah, exactly. Well, and and by the way, yes, there is a graphic and an accompanying crying Korean woman in the background for this point. Yeah, right? I like how they were like, Horrible. what's the classy way to show gang rape? Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. don't want to scare off our listeners of grandmas and mentally ill grandpas. I, well, I also feel like Dennis Prager was like, you know, I've got all this audio of crying Korean women. I might as well put some. <laughs> I bought it on many it. vids. We must be able to use it in multiple <laughs> ways. <laughs> But he's like, well, and you know what? I don't even need to resort to extreme examples like World War II. And I'm like, well, did you just want to talk about raping Korean women then? I just really needed an animation of a Korean rape. And I can't tell you why, because the doctor <laughs> so, will put me back in the no. hospital. Yeah. I really wanted it to be tax deductible. So. No, but then he's like, let's do a relaxed example, abortion. Right. And we'll talk about that now. Yes, we don't need extreme examples. Let's just take my stance on abortion. And I, I also, I love that like most pro-life people, he can't even state his position without admitting it's bullshit, right? Where he's like, a he, fetus is a human being that does, has a right to live, subject to clauses A, B, and C, and paragraphs four and five, which we found <laughs> didn't test well with our voters. Yeah, give me a fucking break. Yeah, honestly, if the Bible had like a random chapter in it that just said 30 weeks, Wink. Trust me, this will make sense in 1973. <laughs> like, you know, I'd be a lot more impressed. Still wrong, yeah. but, you know, way more credible at that point. Yeah, no, exactly. And again, just, just point out, his point is nonsense because pro-choice people aren't following their consciences. Right. They're following larger societal morality, really. Right? Like, everyone has the initial gut reaction that abortion is bad. That's why you hold up signs of gooey hands and not ideas. We as a society go... No, nah, man, it's like a fucking nickel in there. And we're like, oh, I didn't realize it was a nickel because I've never been inside a uterus. Thank you, agreed morality of society for saving me from Dennis Prager. Right, right, exactly. Like, like, keep in mind, we also think that like we instinctively do that with things like autopsies and surgeries, too. Right, right. Dentistry. <laughs> Well, and he's like, well, you know, both people on the pro-life and pro-choice side are equally convinced that their conscience dictates their views. I'm like, well, I guess the problem couldn't be conscience then. What is the difference <laughs> then between those two people and how they determine their morality? I think we've isolated a variable, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you want to talk about it? Also, uh, cut. Dennis, uh, pro-choice people aren't secretly having the same amount of non-abortions <laughs> as pro-life people. So uh, they're not e equally acting on their consciences. <laughs> Exactly. Right. Right. But he doesn't need to ex uh, resort to extreme examples like abortion. Just take his transphobia instead. Right. Because that's his next God. one. He's like, even people who mutilate girls by turning them into boys think that they're following their conscience. I'm like, yeah. Woof. It's like he has a stopwatch going and he's like, oh, one minute left. What else grinds my gears? Trans people. What's Tra the yep. deal with trans? There we go. Check. Moving on. All right, it's time to present the two sides of the trans argument. Here you go, Dennis, reasonable. They take a Hatari Hanzo sword and they just find a girl <laughs> and just, zah, just cut off her nips and then they send them to people for sending in stories at scathingnews at gmail.com. <laughs> also, I don't want them to do that. Those are the two sides of this issue. Right, yes. But yeah, but he ultimately concludes that conscience is just a euphemism for what I feel. And again, I'm like, then you fundamentally misunderstand what that word means because you have no conscience. You're like a scientist trying to imagine what it's like to see through the eyes of a mantis shrimp or something. <laughs> also, that's not a euphemism. That's literally the definition in the dictionary. Conscience is yep. yes. what you feel morally about something. <laughs> right. The whole thing. So he's like, yeah, so so now that we've got rid of that pesky conscience, what should we replace it with? I'm like, oh, I bet it's your religion, isn't I it? I wrote that too. I was like, oh, oh, I bet it's what Dennis thinks. <laughs> well, but it's even dumber than that because his answer is a conscience, <laughs> right? Like, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't he goes like, well, now you can't trust your conscience. So what do you use? A better conscience. Exactly. <laughs> Hit that like and subscribe button and replace <laughs> that with your conscience. There you go. Yeah. Prager you. But your conscience has to be built a certain way, right? He gives you the four things that you have to base it on. The first is truth, because lies are the mother of evil. 
I feel like the dad's somebody who's trying to convince you that they 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 have lies that live in Canada. You you don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> he also says courage because good is impossible without it. Nope. Hey Dennis, <laughs> have you have you never just done a nice thing for <laughs> right? <free? laughs> that didn't require chivalry. At yeah, the exact there were right, no yeah. zombies to fight my way through on the way to the soup kitchen. So I was like, well, this is ah, bullshit, obviously. <laughs> And and then, of course, you need God, but not some fucking bullshit hippie God or Muslim one, right? The God of the goddamn fucking Judeo-Christian Bible. He yeah. specifies that. Oh, man, there goes the truth. Right. And the big question is, why that God, Dennis, and scene cut? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Get out of the sketch. Well, but then he adds a fourth fucking thing. And I could you I could give you a thousand chances to write down what you think it was. I bet you wouldn't get it because the thing that comes after God is reason. Huh. You also need reason. He says, because God without reason leads to fanaticism. Well, yeah, no, it gets to the, where your kids won't even invite you to Thanksgiving anymore. But reason without God leads to moral chaos, <laughs> like insufficient transphobia, for example. Yes. <laughs> right. I want so badly for him to explain that more. No, here's what happens, right? You're sitting there, you're thinking of logical, reasonable things, and then you're like, it's probably okay for me to fuck the bread at Sainsbury's. And that's, you know, there's one. <laughs> okay, but if you buy it and go home, it is okay to do that. Yes. No, it is. Well, it is. Now, <laughs> now you've proved Dennis Prager correct. I hope you're happy, <laughs> Uh, no, it's so funny because he's like, you know, it would lead to chaos. And I, I was like, like insufficient bigotry. And then he uses his example and it actually is insufficient. But like accepting trans people. Yeah, he's his literal like smug reposes. Unless, of course, you think that men give birth. And I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> <sighs> woof. And then he he sums up everything. He's like, so so you can let your conscience be your guide as long as you agree with me. Right. That's the that's the resolution. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we are doing conscience, but not like the fucking thinky one from the dictionary. My one, <laughs> my, my one. <laughs> old ghost. It's like when it, when you someone has a family card game and they're like, here's the rules. And you're like, oh, fuck, here we go. OK, yeah, right. Well, the good news and the bad news, I guess, is that Dennis Prager has something like seventeen hundred more videos. So I'm sure we'll be seeing him again on a future installment of... God awful minis. Before we hand things over to Morgan this week, I want to remind you one last time that there's no better time to pledge to us on Patreon than the month of May because you might just make Heath do something hilariously embarrassing on camera. Just follow the link on the show notes. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you tonight, but we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our Sister Souls Hot Friend God Awful Movies debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday and an even newer episode of our Half Sister Souls Citation Needed debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I wouldn't earn my supper if I neglected to thank Ethan Wright for being solid as a rock, Lucinda Illusions for being as sharp as scissors, and Eli Bosnick for being as, I don't know, flat and easy to write on as paper, I guess, maybe for covering Heath. I don't know. I also want to thank Lackadaisical Poet for providing this week's very succinct Farnsworth quote. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most marvelous Matreon patrons, Stephen, Sean, other Stephen, Ben, Remy, Joe, Robert, David, ex of God, Heath Enright's husband, Reason, Simo, Jamie, a pawn called Bishop, Mr. Roger, Sweater, Sarah, Twisty Pretzel, Josh, Word of the Broad, Keeping All the Plates Spinning, Alistair, Jason, Pegasaurus, Rex, Uninspired, Becky, Brian, and Kilgore, Trout. Stephen, Sean, Ben, other Stephen, Remy, Joe, Robert, and David, whose cocks would be in the penis hall of fame if they could find room for him. ex of God, Heath's long-lost husband, Reason, Simo, Jamie, Bishop, Mr. Roger, Sweater, Sarah, and Pretzel, who are so sexy the sirens will meet him halfway to the boat and josh word of the broad spinning plates alistair jason pegasaurus uninspired brian becky and kilgar whose iqs are higher than i'm gonna have to get to make it through the damn day tomorrow waiting for the fucking zelda game to drop together these 27 people dinos clothing items fictional characters spouses of fictional characters sisyphean tasks and tasty snacks heard the cry of matreon and sallied forth with their unwavering support this week and if you too would like to march alongside our army you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scathing atheist whereby you'll earn access to an extended ad free version of every episode or 
or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help but you can't donate through Patreon until they apologize for what they said about your dog, you can also help a ton by leaving us a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following us on social media. And speaking of social media, Tim Robertson handles that for us, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. But do it like normal, like a really normal. Yeah, just Don't normal. mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved.